In the woods, it seems that we're going to find a lot of strange and downright interesting stories. Whether it's some sort of Sasquatch trying to break your leg and turn you into soup, or if it's some sort of strange and unexplainable encounter with an unseen being, these In the Woods horror stories will freak you out. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to see your story and potentially share it in a future episode. Now, be sure to punch that like button, subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode, and get ready for these creepy and allegedly true in the woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Now, just about every single person in life deals with stress, anxiety, and all kinds of other things that can cause you mental wear and tear. And as much as some people might look at this as a little bit quote-unquote weak, sharing your thoughts with somebody else who has no bias is very helpful. Mental health needs to be taken more serious, especially if you want your physical well-being to be well. I myself have found a lot of help through therapy. It's helped me get through a lot of issues in my life. Reading all the stories and doing all the documentaries I've done over the years of all these awful, heinous, and terrible crimes have definitely taken their toll on me from time to time. And sometimes it genuinely is nice to have somebody who can talk to me and help me work through some of those things that might be keeping me up at night. So, what are you waiting for? Join me and many others in the swamp today. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Swamped today to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Swamped to get 10% off your first month. A Sasquatch Encounter by That One Guy It was June 2014, just under two years since my two back-to-back encounters in the Mark Twain Forest in southern Missouri. I jumped right into anything I could read or watch right after those experiences. I joined several online Bigfoot communities and read every report I could, which could be placed in my or a neighboring state, which is Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. There were a lot, to say the least. And by the time of this story, if there was a theory on the subject, I had read it. If there were tips on how to up the odds of an encounter, I had read them. I had pins where all the clustered reports had occurred. A friend, we will call Jay, and I were camping at one of the smaller lakes southeast of the east side of the Snoqualmie Pass in Cascades of western Washington. The dirt road winds to the lakes. The trailhead has snow most years, even as late as June. It wasn't clear long, as we didn't see other car tracks through small patches of lingering snow on the road. This was an encouraging sight, and it would make for finding footprints and other things from animals a lot easier. There were a few reports in the area, but there was a cluster not far west from there, and a steady stream of reports over time. East of there, in the Calais Alum area, The back end of this area had been thawed out for a while. The dark spots coming in made it impassable until now, so the forest had been awake for a bit, without the threat of human presence. Seeing we were the first one elicited a massive grin on our faces. We parked at the end of the lake, near our trailhead that takes you up to about two other lakes. The trail goes for miles, past the two upper lakes, eventually hitting the PCT. I mention this because we thought of the trail system as a highway for animals of all kinds, and this, as a possible theory, made sense to us, and the spot we chose is a choke point for the trail system. We set up in a meadow by lake number one. It was kind of a blind corner from the trail. We hoped it would help our odds. We were confident in that since as we decided where to set up, a mountain lion strolled up out of the corner of the trail, seemingly oblivious to us. It jumped a little when I coughed and it bolted down the trail. We laughed and set up our two tents. All that I had for recording was a small but sensitive audio recorder. 
I had a small video camera but did not have night vision. Jay had his phone. We were still fresh to the whole thing and had yet to afford much of any gear before then. We were just happy to be there at that point. It was getting late in the day, especially since the mountains on one side have enormous sheer cliffs hundreds of feet high. We decided to take a quick stroll the quarter mile to Lake Number 2. There was still snow on the trail since this spot gets almost no direct sunlight most of the time. We saw the lion tracks, as well as several other animals. Elk, bear, deer, coyote. We stood and listened. This area is almost silent, minus the wind rocking the trees and the creaks they make as they sway. It was nearly too dark to see, so we returned, had dinner at the campfire, and retired to our tents. I didn't sleep for a long time. I just waited. I hoped behaving like we're sleeping would make a Bigfoot a little bit bolder than if we were awake. Sometime around 2 a.m., we were startled by screams somewhere in the distance. The echo made it impossible to determine where exactly they had come from. It went on for several minutes, but we decided it was probably a large cat and drifted back off to sleep. The morning was warm and uneventful. We spent the next day walking the trail up to where it connects to the PCT, looking for signs. None couldn't be explained away, and we were getting a little discouraged. Returning, you cross a creek and walk up to the top of a small waterfall pouring from the lake into the steep valley below. We had to walk out this side to get on the hike, and we were only about five hours into this. But right in the middle of the trail, as it turns into the forest going towards Lake 2, there are two trees over the trail that were broken into an X shape, and there's a smaller tree resting horizontally on the top of the side of the X. This didn't wind down. There weren't roots and they were broken off. And they looked pretty young and healthy. I was excited, and I also was now admittedly very nervous. Jay and I exchanged glances. We knew what this probably meant. It's why we came, sure, but remember, safety is definitely priority. Nobody wants to get wrecked. This structure was thought to be a way to mark boundaries, like a stay-out sign, if you will. We took pictures, measured, noted conditions. I don't need to elaborate on the details. When ready, we passed under it and walked along Lake Number 2 heading for camp. Just animal prints and our previous steps, nothing too crazy or unnoticeable. There were no foot tracks anywhere else that I could see. Again, this is a choke point with nowhere to go but through. We were stumped and assumed it went to the campsite or the opposite direction as us from the axe. There wasn't snow once you left the tree line, so there were no tracks. We got the fire going again, made dinner chilled, and whispered about various topics. Just acting normal. I've heard so many times of people just acting high alert or high anxiety, and that seems to push away all kinds of animals. We were tired around 12. I hung my audio mic off the peak pole of my tent. I set it to record, lay quiet, and listened for an hour before I started to doze off. That's when I heard in the distance a crunch. Then another pause, a crunch, then nothing. It sounded like something took a step or two in the snow, but not close by. It sounded like it was probably a couple of yards away. I was nodding off, about to sleep, when the tent around me became a blur. As it collapsed on top of me towards my head, before I could even scream, the whole tent began to move. Something was dragging me. I screamed my lungs out for Jay as I felt the sharp edges of the bare bushes jab and rub both sides of me, and then I felt the snow. Wh where was I going? I heard Jay scream my name, and it hit me. After some time, I realized it was dragging me towards lake number two. I struggled and twisted, trying to find the zipper for the open mesh top. I saw it, put my hand through it and pulled open. I felt it swing me in the air once and then whoosh, I was flying. I managed to take a deep breath before I slapped the water first, and it hurt. I belly flopped on a skinny, brittle patch of ice into the frigid water. The shock hit me hard. I managed to push out and get to the surface quickly. It was only about six feet deep anyway, but it was enough to submerge me my tent, and all its contents. 
Before I knew what direction I was coming from, I heard Jay scream in terror and seconds later his tent flew out in the dark right past me. I got to the shore as fast as I could, maybe 20 seconds later, and all I could hear was this terrible, thunderous cracking sound followed by a loud cracking and boom. Then there was silence. I was terrified, but I was also going to be hypothermic quick, so I had to rush back to the fire at the camp. I just had to hope it wasn't still there and that Jay was okay. I approached the meadow quickly but cautiously, weaponless. I saw the fire and it was almost out. I listen and hear a quiet sobbing. It must have been Jay, so I called out and he rushes over. The look on his face made it clear he had just seen something absolutely crazy. He said when he heard me scream he got out to see what was happening. He heard something crashing through the trees from the camp and then heard it coming back. He quickly grabbed his keys because he couldn't find his phone in time, ran to the opposite direction from which it was coming. He barely saw it, just for a second. A massive, absolutely hairy creature. Its arm was buff. It reached out from the dark shadows of the tree line behind his tent, grabbed it, and dragged it out of sight. He screamed when it disappeared, and a moment later it stormed back to the tree line by the meadow. He watched as two good-sized trees fell out of the dark, one at a time, over each other. He screamed again as the third tree fell from a different angle. Then, silence again. It was just wind. He crouched low, waiting to stifle his audible fear, when he heard me call for him. After we stoked the fire a lot, we helped get some flames going again and it warmed us up a bit. We couldn't leave that fire before first light. The trail down to the vehicle was steep, slick, and if it was if it was any darker, we would definitely be in trouble, so we waited. As soon as we could see, we cautiously ventured over to Lake Number 2 to see if there was anything salvageable from our sunken tents. Unfortunately, nothing really was, and in true Bigfoot encounter cliché, every electronic gadget we had was destroyed in the water. So, no, of course, we didn't get the pictures from the trail cams or any damn fingerprints. Honestly, that night of chaos solidified it in my mind. We returned to the camp, tried to salvage what was left of it, and got out of there. Honestly, in these stories, people who see me as crazy or anybody in these types of things as crazy might actually need to open their eyes a little more. There is all kinds of stuff out there in the woods, just waiting to be discovered. Possible Skinwalker Experience by USS Bitchin As an 18-year-old, I started dating a girl whose family was Native American, and I think she was part of the Soshone. I am trying to remember. After a year or two of dating her, I got to visit the reservation where her tribe was from in Pocatello, Idaho. After the first few days there, at dinner, I asked her father, who apparently was a high-ranking chief, about Wendigos and skimwalkers at dinner. The dinner table got very quiet, very fast. He told me not to bring up the subject during dinner. Later that night, he came to our room and told me about them, their history, how they came about, etc. He spoke of them in a very severe yet cautious tone. After that night, I didn't speak of them or even think about them and I tried to avoid conversations about them because of what I heard her father tell me. I don't know if he was attempting to screw with me because I'm your typical white guy or whatever. I don't know. But I believed the stories, the history, all of it. She and I split a few years later because we were falling apart. A couple of years after I met my wife in 2019, we got married in March of 2022 and found out we were pregnant in July of 2022. We were happy and nervous about our lives ahead of us. After about a week or so of finding out, we decided to go camping, seeing it may be one of the few times we had to ourselves before our child came. So we went up to Affleck Park Campground up in Salt Lake City in the Wasatch Mountains. The campground was empty, and we saw no other tents or cars. We got all set up, had dinner, talked around the fire, and just hung out. Well, it was bedtime. We went into the tent, talked some more, and then we both heard what we assumed were rats or little animals walking around the bushes and trees. We fell asleep after a while of listening, 
and while we slept, I had the strange dream, or at least what I hope was a strange dream. This dream was that I was asleep in my tent with my wife at the same campground right where I was physically and there was a rustling of bushes and trees and an ominous feeling of dread or fear in the air. Something was circling our tent. Looking at the tent, I could feel it wanting to be inside with us. The next part I remember, as if I was awake, watching it happen in real time. The dog, wolf, or whatever creature it was, was black as a bottomless pit with sharp yellow eyes. It stood over us while we slept, watching us, almost like an out-of-body experience. While this black wolf dog creature just stood over us while we slept in the dream, I was awake, feeling that this unknown beast was standing over us, watching us sleep. I pretended to be asleep by keeping my eyes shut, but I could feel it staring at me as if I knew that it knew that I was faking sleep. It just stood over us, watching us the whole night, while I pretended to be sleeping. Eventually, I remember peeking my eyes, checking to see if anything was there, and there was nothing. The tent zipper was all closed, and I asked my wife if she had a weird dream last night. She said she did, but she didn't really speak much after that. After getting dressed, I packed up as I was in a hurry, skipping breakfast, and left. A year and a half later, I still remember the feeling of the dog or the wolf and its yellow eyes staring at me as if it knew my conscious self was aware of what was happening. At work last week, a co-worker brought up the subject of skinwalkers and wendigos. Those feelings of dread, fear, and helplessness entered my body once more, just at the subject's sound. I felt all my hair rise. Being a construction worker for over five years, I'm not a badass, but I am definitely used to uncomfortable situations. I became scared, looking for a way out. I could just see those eyes as if they were before me again. Would this be considered an encounter? If I do not understand, I just remember being taught that skimwalkers can enter one's mind through dreams. The Forest Edge by Kawa Stories echo through the generations in the remote corners of northern Canada, where the vast wilderness meets the border with the United States. Tales of skimwalkers, ghostly apparitions, and cryptids linger in the air, passed down from elders to the curious youth. I've had my share of inexplicable encounters with the supernatural, which have left an indelible mark on my understanding of the world. Yet, one night in particular, a chilling evening in October of 2010, stands out among the rest. Our small Canadian community is shrouded and surrounded by woods, threaded by narrow trails navigatable only by ATVs or the adventurous souls on foot. It was a place where the veil between the seen and unseen felt thinner than anywhere else. And it was on the night that my friends, Oaks and Day, and I decided to tread the road notorious for its dark history. Snaking through the wilderness for three eerie miles, the road lacked the comfort of a single street lamp. Legends swirled around it, whisperings of hitchhiking ghosts, the haunting hoof lady, and the elusive Sasquatch. As darkness cloaked the landscape and the clock struck 8 p.m., we impulsively decided to traverse this haunting stretch of land. Our supplies were minimal. A solitary flashlight, coats to ward off the chilling air, and our own company, I guess. Oaks and Day were fervent in their anticipation, recounting tales of spectral encounters from their family lore. But for me, a sense of dread loomed over this escapade. Stories of disappearances and inexplicable phenomena had instilled a deep-seated fear of the unknown. As we approached the forest edge, the road lay ahead, faintly illuminated by passing vehicles. The sight provided a sliver of reassurance amidst the encroaching darkness. Day held the flashlight, its beam withheld for reasons unknown while my friend's boisterous chatter sought to mask the unsettling silence. Minutes dragged like hours, 
each step amplifying the quiet unease that had settled within me, and about halfway along the road stood an abandoned farmstead, a decrepit relic of the past. Oaks, fueled by curiosity, proposed exploring its crumbling interiors. Instinctively, I opposed to the idea, urging a swift return home. Yet as we drew closer to the derelict farmhouse, Day's sudden gasp shattered the night's tranquility. She claimed to have seen a flickering light inside the lonely structure. Dismissing it as a prank, Oaks laughed, playfully chiding her. But a creeping sense of disquiet gripped us as we witnessed a faint glow within the supposedly deserted homestead. It's impossible, Day whispered her voice tinged with disbelief. I too recoiled in horror, my mind racing through a spectrum of possibilities. Was it an apparition, an evil force, or something beyond comprehension? I demanded Day to illuminate the area with the flashlight, yet she hesitated. Fed up with the eerie charade, I voiced my urgency to leave. Peering toward the farmhouse, Oaks confirmed this was impossible. There was a glimmer of light, Without a second thought, I turned on my heels, marching briskly back towards home. Day and Oak stumbled to catch up as my pace quickened. My mind raced with frantic thoughts, regretting not bringing my four-wheeler or a cell phone for emergency contact. The flickering light in the farmhouse haunted my imagination, conjuring sinister possibilities. Was it a spectral entity, an evil presence, or perhaps something more extraterrestrial? The pounding of our footsteps reverberated through the night until abruptly I realized the eerie absence of my friend's hurried steps behind me. A gnawing sense of dread compelled me to glance back. To my horror, Oaks had fallen, sprawled on the ground while Day's panicked cry pierced the night. Her terrified shriek drew me toward the farmhouse, now engulfed in an inexplicable phenomenon. A ball of fire, akin to a dancing flame, emerged within the decrepit structure seemingly pulsating with an unearthly energy. It ascended, perroded, and perched atop the farmhouse, casting an otherworldly glow upon the night. It felt sentient as if its fiery gaze fixated on our fleeing figures. Propelled by sheer terror, Oaks bolted upright and sprinted, urging us to follow suit. We plunged into the woods, the haunting light of the fiery apparition still visible. A surreal and terrifying spectacle that defied rational explanation. The relentless pursuit continued as we fled the winding trails, the luminous enigma of the fireball remaining tethered to the abandoned house. Panic-stricken and breathless, we sought refuge at Oak's grandparents' house. Desperation etched on our faces as we recounted the surreal encounter. Their elderly voices carried wisdom steeped in folklore soothing our frayed nerves with the tales of fireballs. A harbinger, a spectral messenger rather than an evil omen. Their reassurance and stories attempted to quell our fear before we departed for our respective homes. The lingering enigma of the fiery apparition still haunting our thoughts. Days passed, but the memory of the unearthly spectacle lingered. The cryptic words of Oak's grandparents reverberated, resonating with an inexplicable profundity. It wasn't until the untimely passing of an elder in our community, just three days after our chilling encounter, that the pieces began to fall into place. The farmhouse, long abandoned by its owners, had once been the home of a grandfather who had departed from this realm. The fiery apparition we had encountered bore a message, a warning veiled in the dance of flames and otherworldly communication preceding the Elder's passing. Though inexplicable and haunting, the spectral encounter left me pondering the mysteries of our world, reminding me that beyond the veil of the known lies a realm of enigmas, where the supernatural and the ordinary intersect in inexplicable ways. I'm not much of an outdoors kind of guy. I've always preferred to be inside most of the time. This happened four days ago. I was at my friend Greg's house. It was Monday morning in the middle of summer, bright and hot. We were inside playing on his gaming console, 
His mom was cooking breakfast in the kitchen. His dad had left for work already, but had only been gone for a few minutes before we got up. The sweet smell of scrambled eggs with some bacon and toast filled the air. We were your average 15 year old boys, hoodies with ripped jeans and Nike shoes. You suck at this game, Isaac, he remarked. It's not like I sit here 24 seven playing video games all day, I said. Greg's sister soon woke up and came down the stairs. Don't tell me you guys are up at 8 a.m. in the morning playing video games, she said. How about you go back upstairs and play with your Barbie dolls, Greg said. Shut up, Greg. You know I'm too old for dolls, she said. Isaac, Greg, Wendy, breakfast is ready, Greg's mom said. We all ran into the kitchen and made our plates. As we were eating, Greg's mom said, Your sister and I are going to Uncle Dan's house today. Would you two like to come? She asked. No thanks, Mom. Me and Isaac are going to stay here today. He responded. Okay, don't get into any trouble while we are gone, she said. When we were all finished eating, Wendy and Greg's mom got their stuff together and left. Greg and I decided to play video games until they got back. While playing, Greg's mom called us and told us that she and Wendy would be staying the night at Uncle Dan's house, and Greg's dad won't be home until around 5 a.m. She trusted us to stay alone all day and night. We could do whatever we wanted. We decided to play video games all day. Who would be there to stop us? After about five hours of playing, sometime around 1 p.m., we got bored playing video games. We decided to go for a walk outside. We got out of the house and began walking down the street. There were so many cracks in the sidewalk, I'm surprised we didn't fall. We kept walking down the cracked sidewalk. Hey, Isaac. Looks like there's a trail over there through the woods. You want to walk down that instead? The trail was right beside a children's playground that led deep into these tall pine woods. Why would you even think about going in there? I asked. It's fine. It's not dark out yet. And besides, I just saw two kids on bikes right in there. He spoke. Okay, fine. I'll go, but you owe me five dollars when we get back. I spoke. <laughs> Deal, he replied. As we made our way up to the trail entrance, we looked at the giant pine trees towering. There was a sign that read, Pinewood Trail. We made our way onto the trail and began our walk. You could hear birds chirping and the leaves rustling in the wind. It's peaceful out here, I said. No kidding, he replied. We kept walking for what felt like minutes. We were at least a mile into the trail when we spotted a deer off in the distance. Wow, that's a huge deer, Greg said. I wasn't all that intrigued, though. I was more focused on a particular sound I had heard. I swear, I heard a tiny whisper in my left ear. The sound of a woman's voice. Isaac. That's all I could make out. I turned around and saw nothing. Are you okay, bro? Greg asked. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine, I replied. We continued walking farther and farther into the trail. As we continued down the path, I couldn't help but notice that it sounded like the wind was calling out to me. Isaac. Turn back now before it finds you. I started to get freaked out. Greg, can we head back now? I asked. Why do you want to leave already? He asked. I don't know, man. This place just gives me the chills. I replied. <laughs> Are you scared the boogeyman's gonna get you? He replied. Seriously, dude. Can we turn back? I asked. After like maybe two more miles. He replied. Okay, just make it quick. While walking, I caught a glimpse of what I could make out to be a woman in black and white. It looked like she had a jacket and blue jeans on. Hello? I called out, and I got no response. She began to walk away and soon disappeared behind a tree. Who are you talking to? Greg asked. I thought I saw someone, I replied. It's probably just another person walking the trail, Greg said. We continued down the trail further. Once we finished walking those two extra miles, Greg and I decided to head back. As we were heading back, we could see the sun begin to set behind the top of the trees, and we started walking a little bit faster. As we were walking, I thought I caught a silhouette out of the corner of my eye, but I ignored it and kept walking towards the trail entrance. It was dark by this point, and I could barely see anything around me. Good thing we had our phones on us, and we turned on the flashlights and kept walking. Over the sounds of our footsteps, I heard a faint growl come from behind me. In the woods to my right, there was something there. I stopped. Greg, did you hear that? I asked. Yeah, I heard it, he replied. Do you think it was a bear or something? I asked. I don't know, but whatever it was, I don't want to meet it, he replied. 
While talking, a bear-like roar interrupted us. We both screamed and ran in the opposite direction. While running, I shined my flashlight at it. What I saw was absolutely horrifying. It was a pale creature, with no fur and no clothes. It was bald and had deep red eyes. It stood about eight feet tall and had a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth. I screamed to Greg, That is not a bear! I shouted. He looked back and screamed. We were beginning to run out of breath until I saw a set of bushes. We tried to hide in them. We turned off our foam flashlights and hid. We could hear the thing sniffing out for us. As it made its way toward the bush we were hiding in, we prayed that it would not find us. Then it let out that same roar we had heard earlier and ran off. What was that thing, Greg? I asked. I don't know, but we need to get the heck out of these woods ASAP, he said. We got out of the bush and looked around. It was nowhere to be seen. As we made our way out of the bush and back to where we came from, I could hear that same voice again. Go. Follow the animals. They will show you the way. I saw a little blue jay up in the tree. I signaled for Greg to follow me. As I followed the blue jay, I could still hear the creature far off. I could still barely see anything, just the light of the full moon, but that barely even made it through the leaves of the trees. We had finally made it back to the trail. We continued down the path that we took to get there. We could see the entrance. It was right up ahead. That's when the creature stepped in front of the door. We ducked behind a large tree in hopes that we could hide from it. It began to walk toward us. Its heavy footsteps echoed through the woods as it marched its way to us. It was about five feet away from the tree I was standing behind. Greg was behind the tree right next to me. It had grabbed onto the tree I was standing behind. It peeked its head around the tree and it almost saw me until it backed off and suddenly disappeared into the woods again. Greg and I made a run for it out of the trail. We ran straight home without stopping. I don't know how to explain this experience. I have no idea what it was, but it's downright the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced and why you will never catch me in those woods ever again. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true in the woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to smash that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes and that helps the swamp grow its ever expanding waters. If you're new, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe and turn on that notification button so you don't miss new episodes. I upload them nearly every single day on all things natural and supernatural. I also live stream scary stories and other things over on Twitch and YouTube Live. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. You can also send those in on Reddit now at r slash the dark swamp. If you're on the go, but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories and download them and bring them wherever you go, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Thank you guys so much for supporting the Swamp the way you do. I'll see you on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff, and I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.